Well, I want to welcome it to everyone to this session of our Humanistic Judaism 101 class from the Spinoza Havra. Just a reminder that if you're not on our mailing list, be sure and email us anytime at spinozahavra at gmail.com to get on it. Um, I do, before we get into today's class, I do want to uh, sh share a couple of quick things. Well, I have one, one sharing and then, and then one a more discussion kind of thing. Um, on the um, sharing side of things, I just want to acknowledge that for a lot of us in the U.S. right now, we're pretty shook up. Uh, what happened yesterday is pretty deeply distressing, and no matter what your political beliefs are, an act of violence like that is, is just really, really, I don't know, it leaves you unsettled. You don't, and I'm feeling that pr very profoundly right now, and so... I just want to throw that out there to say that uh, today is is we're dealing with what we're dealing with. I mean, for me, it's sometimes nice to have something to think about that's not about current events. Um, and so I'm kind of approaching that standpoint. But um, I just want to throw that out there to say that we're all, we're all, all be gentle with ourselves as possible because these are hard times. Um, um, Martin asks what happened. <clears throat> uh, Donald Trump, the Republican candidate, former president, for, uh, was having a rally in Pencil Western Pennsylvania, and somebody shot at him, hitting him in the ear, and killed a person and wounded two other people in the crowd. Pretty, pretty, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was awful. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a pretty heavy thing, to say the least, um, and a lot of complicated emotions, um, a lot of complicated emotions, so. He's okay, but, but you know, this is just, yikes. <laughs> yeah, you know, all the fears about dem the democracy continuing and whatnot is definitely pretty acute. Right? Yeah, yeah they, they killed the guy that was shooting. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, though, before we get into today's class, I did want to, uh, Martin had, had asked, and I think it's a great question, is, is we were coming up very soon at the end of this class. And so we have a few decisions to make. And again, I would love to for us as a, as a learning community to maybe decide what we want to do. And one of them is, of course, how do we want to do our graduation? Um, what do we want that to look like? Um, but also to talk through some about what are we going to do after this? Are we going to continue having an organized class like this? Or are we going to have more sporadic, um, you know, shorter topical classes? I do think there's some interest I've heard from several of you'd like to keep learning, but I think what, what I've heard so far is a lot of folks saying, I'm not sure I want to commit to a year long class, but I do want to keep learning. And so, so let's talk first about the graduation part. Uh, I think we initially were thinking about that happening sometime maybe around the high holiday time um, was one of the possibilities we'd considered. Um, but what would that look like? Uh, what would the service look like? What are, what are you hoping for? I guess I'd ask it that way in, in such a service. So. Um, I guess I first want to know when it's going to be so I can save the date if I can, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we 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 need to get that pinned down. Martin, since you're the our primary liturgist here, what 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 thoughts do you have? As far, so, what would be helpful for you to hear from us in planning for this service and whatnot? <clears throat> um, just whether people want it to be a group thing or whether they want it to be uh, an individual recognition, like an adoption ceremony for those that are new to Judaism, or it can even be an adoption of humanistic Judaism, for, even for people that grew up Jewish. Um, just really to know like whether they want that to be a group thing or individual, really. Because if it was individual, it it would be. I'm not sure how it would look uh, on the day, but it could be five, five ten minutes for each person, giving a presentation or something like that. You were talking about having a um, thing where you read a talk about the parsha of your birthday, and maybe people could either do that or something else of their choice if that didn't really resonate with them. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think there'd be some that there'd be some choice that you would get to pick uh, which what you'd like. You'd have some guidance from from us about it, but it would be up to you to decide what you want to speak about. And it could be 
it could be the parasha. It could be something else. You have, we'd be, there'd be some choice there. I mean, that that's that's very much a humanistic Jewish thing is that there'd be choice. Well, I am, I, <clears throat> sorry. Go, go for it, Martin. I, I would be keen to have kind of some kind of recognition ceremony for people that have uh, completed it, especially for people that were completely new to to Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, and also a recognition of the fact that people have been dedicated to the community for um, for the entire time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll ask on email, too, to get feedback that way as well. But if you have more thoughts on this, uh, please let Martin or myself know. Uh, I do think I, I agree, Laurie, we need to get a date pinned down. I'm I'm going to suggest maybe that just as a thought to throw out there. Um, and again, I want to hear from others what they think. But my inclination is it might be good if we had a group service. Uh, for everybody, but also for those who, you know, especially for people who are becoming Jewish, I'd, I would also be very open to doing a special service for an individual as well. I think that, that I think there's a kind of uh, both would be options. So just to uh, throw that out there, because I know when we did it for um, who did we do it? We did a service for Martin. Who was it? Um, oh, I can't remember his name. Um, Anyway, though, we can definitely do it. So, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, jump into our topic for today. Let me move my thing around my screen real quick. And today's uh, class will be pretty participatory, particularly for the second half of the class. But for our first half today, we are going to be focusing on Torah and Tanakh. Um, I wanted to initially, my plan was actually to talk about, for us to discuss all Jewish writings, um, significant Jewish writings, but that's just too much for one session. So instead, we're going to focus on Torah and Tanakh. And so in today's class, we'll be doing the following things. First of all, we're going to define some terms. After that, we're going to discuss the idea of genre in Tanakh and why that matters and why understanding genre can be a helpful tool for us. We then will discuss some of the liturgical use of Tanakh in Judaism. After that, we'll compare and contrast Jewish and Christian ways of engaging with Tanakh. And I'm doing that particularly because, one, that's what I know, but also for many of us, we live in majority Christian cultures. And so understanding that how our neighbors engage with our scriptures looks quite different than ours, and to understanding a little bit about that. And then finally, the latter part of this, we're going to be dealing with a more practical issue, which is how do you put together a Devar Torah? And part of that is we're going to do that as a group, just in very informally here. We're going to do breakout groups and play with uh, a parasha for a little bit, do some, and then, then we'll come back and talk about it some. But really what we're trying to do is just doing kind of a little snapshot of what, what you'll be doing on your own when you write your own Devar Torah. So, but I know it's an, it's kind of a, I know it's a big jump to say, it sounds like a really intimidating, scary thing. And so my hope is we can demystify that a little bit today. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about definitions. Uh, move that thing see better up. So I'm trying to make it so I can see chats and, uh, okay, there we go. Um, so the word Torah is a word that has many different meanings. First of all, it can refer to the five books of Moses. Now, we don't have time to go into this today. And today, when I say five books of Moses, I'm referring to the legendary attribution. Uh, most people do not believe Moses literally wrote the five books of Moses, but they are still traditionally ascribed to him. Torah can also refer to the Torah scroll, the physical scroll that contains the five books of Moses, a physical object. Torah can sometimes refer to all of Tanakh, which we'll define that in just a moment. And then finally, Torah, and when I find a very provocative idea, can refer to Jewish teaching more generally of all kinds. By the way, as in chat, someone asked, define Devar Torah. Devar Torah literally means a word of Torah, a bit of Torah. But more colloquially, it's usually referring to a short talk, taking a Torah passage, 
but then riffing on it, taking it and expounding upon it, applying it, maybe giving a midrash, maybe there's many things it can look like, but it's basically a reflective talk that often is beginning with Torah. And again, often it's with a parasha, with the Torah portion, but it can also refer to any kind of Torah, any kind of teaching as a starting point that you're springing from. Okay, so that was the word Torah. And again, frustratingly, it means many things, um, but everything from the five books to all Jewish teaching. The next word is Tanakh. Tanakh also is another is a, another word is also you can refer to it as he, Hebrew scriptures or Jewish Bible. Basically, Tanakh is a mashup of three Hebrew words: Torah, those five books, Nevi'im, prophets, and Ketuvim, writings. And we'll discuss this a little bit 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 further down the road. But these three these three major big pieces uh, components of, of Tanakh, though. The the bits of those words are smushed together from the word Tanakh. Now, these texts are also found in what Christians call the Old Testament, but with a few differences. First of all, the order of the books is different. They lay theirs out differently than we do. We are they are also the two traditions combine the books in different ways. And so the count is different because I I I forget which is which, but I know at least in a couple of cases. One side has them as two books, and the other side has them as one book. Also, another big difference is how the how tradi- how often printed copies of Tanakhs, also called Kumash, when you see it in a book printed form, um, when those in most Jewish Tanakhs or most uh, Jewish Kumashes will often include some degree of commentary. Most commonly, that is very much a Jewish. Um, way of reading a text is you don't read it by itself there's almost always commentary i do know i have one tanakh that has that doesn't have commentary but most of them have some kind of commentary accompanying it uh, that's less common in the christian tradition also some christian bibles mostly which includes uh, roman catholic eastern orthodox and anglican include other jewish texts written in greek as part of their old testament they refer to these as either apocryphal books or deuterocanonical, which means secondarily canonical books. These books are not part of the Tanakh for Jews, but are still incredibly important for Jewish history, most notably in understanding the Maccabean War. I also I find the these writings especially helpful because they're in Greek, because they're giving us an insight into what Judaism looked like in one of the very first times. I mean, it had happened before, but in a big, big way. What it ha- what happens? You translate Judaism into another language, and it's not just that they were using a different. They're reading their their scriptures in a different language now. It affected liturgy. It affected thought. Much of what we do today as Jews comes from this time period, and so understanding it is very helpful, even if it's not part of what we call Tanakh. Okay, another definition is the word Bible. Bible is a generic term for a book of scriptures. Some Jews use it to refer to Tanakh, but since I live in a very hyper-Christian context, I generally don't use the word very often. But instead, I will use, if I'm talking to a non-Jewish person about about their Bible, I would, or about our scriptures, I would say Hebrew Bible. If I'm talking to a Jewish community, I'm going to say Tanakh as much as possible, just to avoid confusion. Finally, there's the concept of sacred text or scriptures. This is a tricky concept for Jews because we have many texts written after Tanakh that are also deeply important and have great value and resonance for us in different ways. And I'm going to share a screen for, let me pull this up real quick. Um, I really liked this list that I found on Wikipedia of all places, and so I want to share it. But it just gives kind of a, um, oh, for lack of a better word, kind of an outline of uh, let's see there's share screen. Okay, this is it says it's a basic structured list of the central works of Jewish practice and thought. And so this is how they break it down. But I think it's a pretty decent one. So uh, Tanakh is, is, of course, very central. But beyond that, you have the works of Talmudic era. You have Midrashic literature. You have Halakhic literature. You have thought and ethics. You have Siddur and, then, and, and Jewish liturgy. And finally, you have Piyut or classical Jewish poetry. 
So all of these writings in some ways might be considered to be sort of in the category of being sacred writings or scripture. The issue is, 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 is what do you do with them and how, how, what do you make sense of them? In a more traditional context, some pieces of this, particularly the Talmudic and rabbinic stuff, is seen as reflecting oral Torah, the idea that God gave the written Torah to Moses at Mount Sinai, those five books, and then he gave this oral tradition that later became written down in the rabbinic era. Um, a more humanistic read of that would be to say the Jewish tradition as a whole, over time, compiled and put together what we call Tanakh, and then later the tradition continued, continued to write, continued to engage. And the key thing and through all of this is to remember that the Jewish tradition always emphasizes different voices. We never say there's one, tr there's only one way it is. There's always lots of voices. There's always disagreement. And so what I find especially profound when we're looking at those other texts, those post-Tanakh texts, is they do an even better job of explaining and of, of providing those multiple voices. Tanakh, if you know what you're looking for, the multiple voices are there, but it's not as obvious. When you get to these later writings, it's much more obvious. And this idea of always preserving the dissenting opinion is very much present in these later texts. Now, unfortunately, for the sake of our time today, we're only going to be talking about Torah and Tanakh. But I did just want to share a little bit of that broader outline just to give um, a bit of the scope of the full range of Jewish teachings. Okay, so now with those that definitional stuff out of the way, let's talk a little bit about genres of Tanakh. And first, let's move into a little bit of discussion. Um, and feel free to either use the raise hand function or to unmute yourself. But when you're reading any piece of literature, why is genre important to you? Or is it important to you? Zianya? Thank you. Hi. So uh, genre is important because it helps you understand the context in which something is saying. So it's not it's not to be interpreted the same if it's a, a historical account, if it's an epic, if it's a romance, if it's even comedy, and uh, particularly uh, with different interpretations of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, there's always this discussion of is it literal, is it not literal, and if you uh, take into account genre then the interp the, the non-literal interpretation changes a lot. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Gabrielle wants to speak? Yeah. Gabrielle, you're mute. Oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Um... I found out for myself that different genres, uh, in my case, imply different ways of reading and to re reacting to the test, the text. I know that uh, Hebrew, classical Hebrew poetry is nowhere like uh, what we consider poetry in the sense of rhymes and stuff like that. But still, there is a way of a cadence. And I am, if when I read poetry, I, I need to fall into the cadence of that to try to kind of like, uh, it's more of a feeling thing. It's less information for the, only for the prefrontal context, uh, cortex. It's, mm -hmm. it's I, I even think I have to breathe with it. I, I don't know how to say it. But, uh, and also you have the, the I mean, from chronological things to pseudo biographies or genealogies or stuff like that, it's it's quite different. Sometimes you feel you're reading a play. I mean, uh, you know, he said the the other one said stuff like that, and other times you feel you're reading just a genealogy or uh, or a chronology and mm -hmm. poetry, of course, and also. In, well, for the people who study uh, Bible, uh, 
they usually identify like poetry as being the earliest layers of original text that was were incorporated into the Torah and Torah. So that's but that's just about Torah, not all the truth. Thank you. Laurie. I think the genre can also tell us about the historical period, like that might be certain times when um, it was more common to write something in poetry, while other times might have a different format. And it would tell you about the history and the context in which it was written. It also might appeal, like like other people have said, to different people, like some people might be more receptive to reading poetry while others might like to read a story or an allegory, of, you know, about something, and others might want to read just, um, a, you know, um, writing with lists of rules. It just depends on people are more receptive to different ways of learning. Excellent. So thinking about Hebrew scriptures, what are some of the genres and subgenres that we can think of? Um, and especially ones that you know that you might find especially engaging. What what are some of those genres? I mean, to me, I feel like there's a big difference in. I I I'm mostly drawn to the narratives the most, but I think there seems to be a big difference in the the early the very early narratives that feel you know, the early stuff in Genesis, Bereshit, that feels like more like a fairy tale almost. It feels much more removed from people living 900 years and a lot more magic. And then you have a shift towards something that looks a little more like history. Um, we also, uh, we have a few hands raised. Before we do that, I'll read a few, few things in the chat. Um, Gabrielle mentioned legends. Um and by the way, so someone mentioned, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. I know some people are having some internet issues today, and that's not a problem. So I'll be be, be checking the chat periodically. So, uh, Zyanya, you had your hand up. Thank you. Uh, I'm guessing Martin and I are going to mention uh, the same thing, Song of, song of Songs, <laughs> basically. Uh, I, I remember uh, studying it in uh, in literature class. Everyone was freaking out, you know, uh, liberal university, how are you bringing that <laughs> Bible out? What are you doing? But, uh, but the professor, it was a history professor, the doctor said, like, you know, uh, hang out, people. There, there's interesting things here we should study. And so we, we were uh, studying a song of songs from a, from a literature point of view, and well, it was it was really interesting. And I don't know if that's what Martin is referring to, erotic poetry. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, it's there. Uh, Lane. There's genealogy mm -hmm. and um, poetry and songs of a non-erotic variety. Mm -hmm. Martin mentioned in the chat prophecy. I want to throw out prophecy is a complicated one because we often in our modern times, you think of prophecy as being fortune telling. And sometimes that's what it was, but it was often much more complicated and nuanced than that. Uh, the, uh, the prophetic the structures they used, and it's super, super interesting. Uh, also, dirges or lamentations, very, very much present. I also, I love the, in the Psalms, particularly the full, full range of, of, of expression. Um, these, these arcs you see of, of um, you know, one minute the psalmist is in the depths of despair, and the next minute on top of the world, and then down in the depths again, and, um, I personally really appreciate those texts because they make me feel less crazy. It's like, oh, wow, the psalmist was kind of up and down, too. <laughs> uh, David mentions wisdom literature, especially the Proverbs. Excellent, excellent. Let me go back and look at my list and see if there's any that we haven't mentioned. Uh, I'd also just throw out there just generalized philosophy. I think parts of Job and Ecclesiastes, I mean, it's kind of... I guess they, they were our wisdom literature, but it's specifically they're really grappling with big questions in a more direct way. And Laurie, uh, did uh, Laurie, did you have your hand up? Yes. 
Um, I just wanted to tell a very brief story about a type a genre. My dad had a Bible. I don't know why. He was very much atheistic, but I looked at it like I must have been eight or nine. And then I happened to open the begats. And I said, I looked in, I said, if this is what it's all like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Lane, do you have your hand up? Yes. Um, I'm kind of smiling because I had a, um, a very in her Christian Bible grandmother who had a different take than many other um, Baptists or other fundamentalists. But she told us really scary stories when I was a child. There was one about a guy being surrounded by lions and a different one about people being stuck in a big fire. And when we had the Parsha this week, um, I think she must have told me something really scary about the plague of snakes because I was very afraid as a child. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like campfire stories a little bit, take on narrative. And I also think about um, sci-fi, especially the way these pseudo history people about ancient aliens talk about Ezekiel's wheel and those kinds of things. So um, speculative fiction, I guess we would say, or, yeah. or some of those social stories. Yeah, the genre piece is so interesting. And I think that's one of the things I would say more generally about Hebrew scriptures is it really is a library. Absolutely. Oh, also Rebecca mentioned epic poetry. Absolutely. Um, now, real quick, I'm just going to mention a few quick passing things. We won't spend a lot of time on this. Just And again, I think many of you are already aware of this fact. But just in case you're not, I want to mention a few quick things. Um uh, Authorship is very messy. Much of the Hebrew scriptures, we really don't know who wrote it. We, there are one of the better theories is called the, the documentary hypothesis about how the, the, the five books came to be, which is of, of, a, of at least four different sources coming together. Um, one, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but just to, to, to mention this in passing, that that is the, the academic consensus these days, is that Tanakh as we know it, big chunks of it were were edited from multiple sources compiled over time and so i think it's a helpful to me as a reader to be looking for that because it 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 just it it shapes how you read it to understand that also understanding it's probably coming from prior oral tradition there are parts though that do to look more like a single author and even some that look like um well i'll give you a great example of the book of ruth i think there's a lot of good arguments that it is a, a novella and it's written in a structure that's very that we that we are expecting from a novella. It comes to it reaches a point really um, a crisis point quickly. It's resolved. It's ended, but in a in an arc that's not very common in the ancient world at all at this point in time. So there's a lot of different. Um, so there are some books that like a book like that may have had a single author, but many others did not. Um, another thing is language. Almost all of Hebrew scriptures is in Hebrew. There's a few exceptions. I believe in the book of Daniel, there's a few sections that are in Aramaic, which is a language very similar to Hebrew. But otherwise, Hebrew is the language of the Jewish scriptures. And that is a significant thing for us because in the Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, we keep going back to Hebrew even when we use translation. Um in a ways that I don't think Christians do very much is, but in the Jewish tradition, even for folks who are not Hebrew fluent, there are so many resources online to look words up, to try to understand better. Um, it really does give us some insights we wouldn't have otherwise. And so I do want to throw that out there. So the next thing I want to talk about today is briefly talk about the use of Tanakh and liturgy. And because because of our time constraints, I'm focusing on the practical today. What is the bare minimum that you might need to get started in, in your Jewish life, whether or deeper Jewish life um, at this, this stage of wherever you're at? And so one of them is how do we use Tanakh liturgically? Or in other words, how do we use it in services, in rituals, lives, and holidays, and all these contexts? And so traditionally, how that's played out is that you have a system of parashah or Torah portions. So the entire five books of Moses is split in chunks to line up with each week of the year. Because the Jewish calendar is kind of complicated with leap years and leap months and all this business, there are some 
weeks of the year where you'll have a double portion. So they have combined them to two. But for the most part, Jews around the world are on the same cycle. Now, you get into the weeds, there are some complexities. For instance, I know that my reform temple that I know they always say at a certain time of year that we're following how they do it in Israel and another part of the year we're not. And I still don't understand the difference. Someone who's smarter than me can explain the difference. But I think there's often, depending on what part of the year you're in and what, and what part of the Jewish movement, Jewish world you're in, you might be a week off, but you're within one week of where everyone else in the world is doing. And I, I think there's a lot of power in that sense of connection, um, which is kind of cool. Along with these Torah portions, and these are typically three, four, five chapters, so there are a pretty good little chunk of text, but it's not a massive chunk of text. Uh, what Jews do with these texts looks different in different movements. In Orthodox, and I believe in, I think in conservative uh, services as well, the text is read uh, in Hebrew and the entire thing with a set of, I believe it's seven aliyah or aliyot, where people will go, are called up to the, the, to, to the Torah, give a blessing, and then the next chunk of it is read. And, and that entire, the whole Torah portion is read in Hebrew. In more progressive um, congregations, that would be uh, reform, renewal, reconstructionist groups like that, you're more likely to see that they'll be using the Torah portion, but they'll only be reading maybe three to six verses would so be a more typical situation. I know in my reform temple here in Oklahoma City, that's that's the custom that you have. You, you have someone called up the Torah, they give the blessing, and then someone else, occasionally it'll be the person doing the blessing. But usually it's another person that reads the Torah in Hebrew. Some people chant it, some people just read it. And then the most common practice is the person, after they've read the Torah passage, those three, five, six verses, they'll then translate it on the fly into English. And then that's that's the Torah part. Um, and then I will mention in some services, particularly in the humanistic world, it is not uncommon that there is not a, a Torah reading at all. Or there may be a reading from another text, often kind of taking the idea of Torah, meaning not just the five books. And so this is where you're going to see a pretty big difference in how different Jews deal with the text. I do think, though, even if you're in a community, and like ours, it does not always use the Torah portion each, each time, I still think there's value in knowing what the Torah portions, tracking with them, because it helps you to understand what the rest of the Jewish world is dealing with. I also personally find value in Torah portions because they force me to engage with text I might otherwise ignore. It's easy to do that, but I think there's value in wrestling even with challenging, difficult text. Uh, by the way, in the chat, uh, Gabrielle said, Aliot is plural from Aliyah, that is going up to the lectern to read. And that's a really good point. The idea, by the way, when we talk about, about someone uh, uh, being given an Aliyah, it means they're, give, they're give, being given the honor to go up the Bema. Just as Moses went up Mount Sinai to, to receive revelation, when you go up the Bema, read from Torah, then you're doing your Aliyah, metaphorically speaking. So another, uh, the other two categories of texts that I think that I want to talk about liturgically are Haftorah, which is a set, which is another set of liturgical, it's um, basically it's selections from the rest of Tanakh that line up with the Torah portions. And sometimes when you're reading Haftarah and you're reading alongside the Torah portion of the week, you can see, oh, I totally see why they picked this Haftarah. Other weeks I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I don't get it at all. And uh, that's just how it is, at least in my experiences, that, that sometimes I can see the connections, sometimes I don't. Sometimes you can see the Haftarah might line up with the holiday that's, in that's involved with this time period, while the Torah portion doesn't. There's a lot of possibilities here. But Haftorah is the supplemental reading from Tanakh. Also, Haftorah, in some ways, has another important cultural resonance, which is in the early days of when Bat Mitzvah, uh, which is uh, the, the B'nai Mitzvah ser ser service for, for girls, was first inaugurated. Initially, more traditional Jews would not let girls read from the Torah, but they could read from the Haftorah. And so for a long time, that, and because of that, though, there's actually been a lot of female authored commentary on the Toph Torah because of that that history a little bit. Now today that is not the practice in 
most of all liberal Judea, all forms of liberal Judaism. Now, women can read from Torah just like men. That's not an issue. Um, but once upon a time, it was. And so because of that, there was a time that Haftor had this kind of different resonance. Uh, the other category that I think is important to talk about liturgically um, are the five me 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 megalot. Uh, the five megalot are separate scrolls. So they're not part of the Torah scroll. They're separate, smaller scrolls. And they're scrolls for the Song of Songs, which is read at Passover, the Book of Ruth, which is read at Shavuot, the Book of Lamentations, which is sometimes read at Tisha B'Av, Ecclesiastes, which is read at Sukkot, and Esther, which is read at Purim. However, I have learned that there are some differences between different Jewish branches, and I'm, I'm not meaning denominational, I'm meaning cultural branches. I mentioned Ashkenazi and Sephardim, there are different traditions about the five megalos and whether they get read. And so I'm not going to to the detail of that i'm only mentioning that in passing that i'm not saying that universally all jews read these five things on those holidays but just to say that some do but those complexities we won't get to go into today as far as which groups use which ones but i would say these five megalotes i i personally am also i like them because they're short and they're texts you can really get into for a short period during a holiday song of songs i think is you know a delightful sexy book that's fun to read and i like it being brought out at passover which with its connections also to fertility and all these other things in the background of her holidays we see song of songs uh with ruth that connection to the to uh the shavuot of, of the harvest theme but also uh the, the conversion theme uh gabrielle mentioned ecclesiastes is my favorite along with ruth yes um these are these are these are these are, to me, are kind of very meaningful because of their special way they're used. The other piece that is used a lot in, litur in liturgy is are the psalms. And again, we will not have time to go into this in detail today, but a significant amount of traditional liturgy comes from the psalms. A lot of our songs we use in all kinds of ways comes from the psalms. There are also special psalms that are said, at, said during certain holidays. Uh, so the Psalms is something that Jews have traditionally gone to that well many, many times uh, for liturgical purposes. Okay, so that's the liturgical piece. I want to now, last bit of teaching part before we get into some more practical stuff, I want to talk briefly about how do Jews read Tanakh and how is it different than how Christians read it? And again, I'm doing this in particular because uh, most of our time, most of our services and our classes, the majority of us live in the places in the world that are majority Christian. And I, while we share some common texts, we do have some common traditions in the background there. We also have some big differences. And I think one of the biggies is how we read the text. What do we do with the text? And so I want to talk about that a little bit. And this is going to be oversimplified, but um, it is what it is. Um, first of all, I think that Christian interpretation tends to focus a great deal on finding out what is the right interpretation. In other words, it's saying you can read a text, and now there should be a right interpretation. And if you study it long enough, learn the context, learn this, learn that, eventually you'll come to the objectively right interpretation. The Jewish tradition does not teach that. Rather, the Jewish tradition says there are multiple shades and levels of meaning and that disagreeing about the text is a great thing. In fact, one of our most treasured of traditions is the Kavruta method of learning. And that's where, you know, our modern version of that in Zoom are breakout groups. But it's the idea of getting together with one or maybe a few people to talk about something, to engage with it, to argue with it, but to doing so from a place of solidarity, of collegiality of we're in this together we're both here to to encourage each other to spur each other on and so part of it is it's it's and i would just say it's a different kind of energy it's it is more of bringing into this that some as trying to capture the spirit that comes in two people the magic and the two people engage together when they're sharing their ideas and what happens when those ideas bounce off each other that is the jewish tradition because of that, I'll also say the Christian tradition, at times, scriptural interpretation can be a solitary endeavor. The, um, the minister uh, alone in their study, studying by themselves, 
Judaism, uh, much less so. I'm not saying that Jews don't read scripture by themselves and work with it by themselves. Of course we do. But what I am saying is that most often we're seeking to bring in other voices, which means it might be flesh and blood people that we're, that we're across the table from in a Kavruta type of study. It might be in the context of the community as a whole of talk. It could be um, reading, going back in time of saying, let's see what Rashi said about this. Let's see what Soporno said about this. Let's go back to all those other commentators over time and see what they said about it. And the idea then is it's a con conversation that transcends, transcends levels. Martin, you said in chat, Christians, at least evangelical, tend to be more sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone, whereas we have the, the pardes exegesis method. Martin, I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you, could you unpack that a little bit more, the Pardes? I've heard about that. I don't know a lot about it. I'd love to hear more. Could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, sure. It's um, how you can read the Torah as the Pshat, the surface level meaning, or the literal the literal meaning. Uh, the, the Remes, which is like the hints or the deep uh, allegorical. Then the Drash, which is a uh, comparative Midrashic component. And then the Sod. So the mystical. Um, and I always find that in conversation with evangelical Christians uh, who are always in the Jewish neighborhood <laughs> in the street, um, that they they tend to just have the. Well, it's interesting because they 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 say that they are solid scriptura, but then they do this. Uh, what's it called? A foreshadowing kind of thing. They say. You know, you'll ask them, uh, where is this in the Torah? And they'll say, well, this obviously means Jesus, et cetera, et cetera, which, which is interesting because it's actually a form of paradise itself. Um, but they, yeah, they don't seem to, they don't seem to have a very strict kind of demarcated, uh, exegesis, uh, um, method mm -hmm. from what I've noticed. No, I think that's pretty accurate. I, I yeah, I think that that's a good way of describing it. I would say too. Um, I would say that that the the big factor is the Jewish tradition emphasizes the idea that we are effectively time travelers. We are in conversation with those who've gone before, and we're coming all the way up to the present. And so you have this continual conversation that the text doesn't stand by itself and that's and that's maybe one of the biggest criticisms of particularly the evangelical christian approach would be to say the bible you can take it on its own merits and read it all by itself and that's all there is to it by the way in the chat as Yanya posted anglicans are closer to us taking into account archaeology history etc modern secular interpretations but the priest is still the theologian who studies all these things Yes, and I would add to that, um, the Anglicans, I think, are much closer to us. I would also say many liberal Protestants and some Catholics would be as well, that there is a growing awareness of, um, of some better ways of reading text, of engaging with it on multiple levels. Um, what I would say, though, that is not as present is the interpretive tradition. And so um, there's less of a sense of... of um, I don't know. It's, it's not it's not as solidified the sense of an interpretive tradition. Um, also, Martin put in the chat, and I, uh, this is helpful. Uh, uh, Pardes. Uh, one, Peshat, plain or literal meaning. Two, Grimez, hints or deep meanings. Three, Drash, comparative or Midrashic. And four, Sod, secret or mystical. And so these are all there. And the, the beautiful thing about Jewish scriptural interpretation is we get to engage with it all. It's all ours. And so I would also argue as humanistic Jews, there are times I think that people sometimes have the attitude of that, oh, the, the Torah, yeah, we're not the Torah people. You know, we'll let the Orthodox be the Torah people. We're not. No, no, no. I totally disagree. With that. Nobody, Torah, this, this wealth of ideas and thought, we all get to argue with it. We all get to engage with it. We all get to push back on it, too. But it's all it's all there for us. And it also means we can we can approach it from different levels. We can take different things from it. Okay, so this is a really fast, but I wanted to, to do this pretty quickly because I wanted to move into actually working through a text a little bit. 
and also kind of showing a little bit of what this looks like. So I'm going to real quick queue up. Safaria. Uh, In fact, you know what I should do? I should actually share screen for the very beginning. So um, I'm doing this uh, just because Safari, we are so, so fortunate at this moment in time to have this kind of resource, which just did not exist not that long ago. But if you're not familiar with Safari, it is a website and a cell phone app. Uh, I will mention if the cell phone app is really nice because you can actually download the text for offline access and i even like that a lot when i traveled internationally where i have really bad internet connection i can actually have all of safari downloaded to my phone so i have offline access and so that's one of the things i really like but it has to be on a cell phone app you can't you can't have offline access on a computer unfortunately but on the computer the big advantage is is you, you have doing the, the uh, source sheets and all but what I want to show today is how, let's just say that we were, and we're going to do this together, actually. We're going to do the first part of this together, of looking at a few things resource-wise, and then we'll do breakout rooms to talk about this. But I want to say, let's just say that we today as a group, we're going to, we want to put together a, a, a Devar Torah about this week's Torah passion, of portion. So we have Safari pulled up. I'm going to click on Tanakh. By the way, though, you can see these other categories, Mishnah, Talmud, Midrash, Halakha, Kabbalah, Liturgy, Jewish Thought. Uh, Tosefta, Kassidut, Musar, Responsa, Second Temple, and Reference. So there's a lot of stuff here, but we're looking for Tanakh. So I click on Tanakh. And now on the right, and so you can jump to a, an individual book over here, but on the right-hand side, this is what I want to look for. Weekly Torah portion. It tells me what my weekly Torah portion is. Also tells me the top Torah for this week. Now, one thing I will throw out in practical terms, if you're in a congregation, you do want to check and make sure they're using, they're they're lined up with the same Torah portion. There, there is, there are some congregations that use a slightly different, different, it's off by a week. So double check that. But assuming we're on, we know this the week, then we can, we can have right here, it gives access to the text. And so I'm going to click there. So now that we've accessed the text, a few things about this is one is we can change the translations. And so I think I actually go right up here. I click on the translation. Is that it? No, I may have done that wrong. I did do that wrong. Let me back up and I'll go back. Maybe it pop up the... Yeah, come on. I thought it was there. Okay, here it is. So translations. So we have choices here. So I can click on this for translations. And then this gives us uh, contemporary tour. JPS is what's what's picked as the default. But you have the Everett Fox translation. Uh, Koran, which is a more traditional uh, Hebrew uh, translation in English. Uh, se several other different translations. The 1985 JPS translation is a really commonly used one. Uh, the 1917 JPS translation to me sounds like the King James Bible, but um, it's there if you want it. So there's a variety of translations. Uh, there's also in a few other languages. Here it is in two translations in German, one in Esperanto. Oh, that's awesome. One in Persian, two in French. Of course, you have the Hebrew. And this is, okay, this is the one that's Hebrew you think why is there a Hebrew translation? Well, this is a translation into modern Hebrew, which is a little different than biblical Hebrew. And there's a Polish, Russian, Yiddish. So those are the different translations you have choices here. But what it does in Safari is it's it's an interlinear. So it shows here's the verse in Hebrew, here's the verse in English. And if I remember right, I believe let's just pick an interesting. So I'm going to say that second word there. It looks like it's Balak to me, but I'm going to click on it. And I'm, yeah, it'll, is it trans? Yes, it told, yeah, it says, uh, I didn't translate the word. I wonder if there's a way I could actually look up the, oh, there it is. So I highlight the word and there it tells, tells me the definition right there. And so this is the powerful thing. Even if you're saying, I don't know Hebrew, how can I learn Hebrew? Well, just get started by highlighting a word, checking it, see what it says. Uh, let's, let's try something else here. Let's see uh, this word. 
And I think a lot of us know it, but I'm going to look it up anyway just for fun. See what it tells us. Yisrael. And it gives you the dictionary definition. This is right here in Safari. And so this is the big, the nice thing about, about, about the text in Safari. So then that we also have under resources, we have, for instance, let's say I want to see what commentary. They have 91 different commentaries. So let's just pick, let's see what Rashi says. Oh, like we'll just look at this this first verse here. Let's see what Rashi says. It says, Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel done to the Amorites. That's the text. So Rashi said, he said to his people, the, and so he cites another passage in Numbers, gives us some details. So we can see this running commentary along the way, right there alongside the text. We also, though, besides the commentary, we also have Midrash. Midrash is often filling in the gaps. It's telling stories, fleshing things out as well. And we have other. And then down at the bottom, under resources, we have sheets, web pages. So these are things that users of this website have used. So let's look at for sheets, just given ideas. These are things that people have, have created, but that cite this text. So here's someone wrote, Israel and Moab, a special relationship. Here's one, Kabbalah and Parashat uh, Kukat. Uh, Parashat Balak, donkeys, angels, prophecy in the Torah. So these are all uh, what other people have written, have, have said. So let's, I'm just curious, the donkeys, angels, and prophecies. Let's see what this person said. So here's here's this person's text, the, the, their commentary on it right next to the biblical text. And so... Anyway, just I wanted you all to see just kind of the possibilities here. So let's now, I'm going to go back out, and we're almost done with the show and tell. Um, so now I'm back to the, so I went back to the front page of Safari, went to Tanakh, and now I'm gonna, I want to see what Taftor is. For, so remember, we're, the um, the Parashat is about uh, Balak, but let's see what the Haftor, this is from Micah. And so here here's the Haftor. So here's our challenge for today. Well, before we do the challenge, let me real quick, I'm going to stop share for just a moment before we get into the do our challenge. And let's, let me pull up, uh, let's look at these chats real quick before we go on. Uh, Zianya says, I love that they have Esperanto. When I don't understand something in English nor Spanish, the simplicity of Esperanto never fails to drive the message home. Yeah, I love Esperanto. It's, it's an interesting language too. As Yanya also says, Katena Bible app is an amazing Christian app, like their equivalent to Safari. If you're ever in need on, of their point of view for any reason, they have commentary by denominations, Oriental, Eastern, Catholic, Protestant, and non-religious academics. Excellent. I will check that out. Thank you. Thank you, Zyanya. So one, I'm going to give a couple more thoughts real quick about Devar Torah before we do our breakout rooms. For Devar Torah, essentially we're engaging with a text like we're doing today. The question is, first of all, to engage with the text, to 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 read it, consider whether you want to read it in Hebrew as well, if you're able to, or look at some of the Hebrew words, look at it in English, look at some commentaries. And then the question is, what do I do with this? And a lot of times in, in the context of our Torah, the real question is, what does this mean for me? But really, it's going deeper. What does this mean for my community? Is there something here for my community? That I'm speaking with. And sometimes the answer is no. In my opinion, sometimes there are texts that I can't find anything for. More often, there is something if you dig deep enough. And sometimes the point is, I don't agree. The text says this, and that's the wrong message for the community. So I'm going to explain to the Torah community why the text is wrong. That's fine in a Devar Torah, in my opinion, at least, in our context. The issue is, did you engage with the text? And then it's from your engagement that you're sharing. So, so what I'd like to do for our challenge, and we have, let's see, one, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. I think we have about 10, 10. So I think we're going to do it in groups. Uh, how many we're breaking? Oh, we have 10, 10 screens. So let's break into groups of threes. And one group will have a. Actually, I won't be in a group, so that'll make that'll be three groups of three. And so when I want to, and we're going to take about twelve minutes, um, so that that you can um, talk together about. Um, in fact, let's just for simplicity's sake, because we don't have a ton of time, let's just take one chunk of this because there's no way we'll we'll 
Let's just find a small little piece of this. Let's see. Okay, so let's just do verses two through seven. So numbers 22, two to seven. And so the challenge is, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll even put the link in the chat so you'll have the link to get, I think, let's see if we can, I think it'll do it this way. Yes, it will. Okay, so I'm going to put the link in the chat. And if you want to, you may want to copy the link so you can have it in the conversation. But my suggestion for your group, for each group, is to take a moment to read the text out loud. And then after that, to talk about it, to, to engage with it, to see what you think about it. And then feel free to use any of the resources on Safari or any other resources you want. The challenge is you got 12 minutes. So it's not a ton of time. And the question we'll have is, is there something here that's meaningful to our community or to you as an individual? And it's, if the answer is no, that's fine. But I'm going to challenge you to say, try to find something. So, What passage are we looking at? It's Numbers 22, 2 to 7. And I put the link in Safari to, 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 the, to the text. But I'll put the reference as well. So we'll be in groups for about 12 minutes. And... And again, this is not this is meant to be low pressure. It should be um, this is more of see what this is an experimental thing. I guess I'll put it that way. So. OK, everybody. So for the first. Um, um, I should have written down who was in what room. So I, I guess I'll let each room decide how y'all want to share some of your thoughts. What what what, what bubbled up in your conversations? I'll start. We said there was so little there. We had like two or three things to say, and then we didn't have anything else to say. So mm -hmm. we went on to, after a little while, we went on to read more of it. And then it was just a shaggy dog story about Balaam and his ass. <laughs> and that didn't get us anywhere. So all we, all we, said, talk, we talked about overpopulation. We talked about uh, like the potential, like in Israel, if, if you know, uh, there are more uh, Muslims outnumbering Jews, that politically that could be a difficult position. And there wasn't much to talk about. Anyone else have more? <laughs> we hope. And I'll admit, I purposefully chose something kind of challenging because it's it's hard. Some stuff is easy. I, I purposefully chose something that would I thought might be more challenging. So if you feel frustrated, that was by design. So... If it's if it was challenging, we missed the point. <laughs> I think. Well, Martin, uh, we were. I was with Martin and with uh, Heather, and Martin uh, made an interesting point that when one finds something challenging, one could think of, okay, or what take it as what not to do, or take it as what are the emotions that. Uh, that are implicit here and, and what does how does that relate to how we react or or respond to situations and uh so like i was thinking that uh well commenting that that even in today's world when we are scared uh uh if you are not a firm atheist you might at some point say oh please heavens or god or whatever help me uh, because one wants, uh, you know, to allay, allay the fears or to temper down, you know, uh, uh, to feel le less exposed. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't believe in the supernatural, but every time I, I, one of my pets go away, I mean, die, I, and me, I say, okay, uh, he went over the rainbow bridge. I hope I meet him again or she. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like uh, there's a human way to respond to uh, fear a lot. And uh, so it's natural that people might have felt afraid, especially because there was no empire controlling that land. So, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, people would fight against each other for control of resources. 
Mm -hmm. Excellent. By the way, Martin put in the chat, he said, I tried to summarize what we said here. At the time, the people were competing for resources and territory and had no supreme leaders or emperors, so they appealed to the supernatural and put curses on their enemies. This is a testament to the fact that the Israelites at the time were still polytheistic, or at least were henotheistic, and their tribal gods were appealed to. It is also a very human response in times of war to respond with the wish to curse the threat. The Parsha can remind us of the importance of understanding and empathy in our interactions with others. When faced with fear or perceived threats, rather than reacting with hostility, we can strive to understand the root causes of our fears and address them constructively. Leaders and individuals alike should aim to use their power and influence ethically, promoting peace and understanding rather than conflict and division. The Parasha reminds us hum of human, re human rivalry and the problems with it. Ooh, I like that. That's a great summary. What I really like about this was, was that it found modern points of application. It found things that we could connect to, that we at times also feel uncertain. We at times often fear fearful. We at times are often tempted to pray words we may not even believe because we, we're, we're scared. Uh, they, these are very human things. I, I like that a lot. What are other thoughts that bubbled up? Or yeah. that may, or what may be bubbling up now in response to what has been shared. That's part of the magic of this too, is that things bounce off each other. Um, I can share. Um, so our group, um, we kind of uh, hitched on how we were seeing kind of like the cycle of violence play out um, in the specific text. Um, so we looked into a bit of like, you know, what um, the first line said about, oh, you know, what did Israel do to the Amorites? Well, they kind of destroyed the Amorites and conquered them and whatnot, I suppose. Um, and so what's the response to that? You know, what what did the elders of Midian, how did they respond to that? And yeah. what happens when we get in, stuck into these kind of kind of cycles of violence and how can we stop that mm -hmm. what can we do to stop that kind of thing um so that's kind of the overall reach that that our group had oh and how it's connected to everything that happens today mm -hmm. One thing I will mention that you'll notice, I did something kind of clunky. And again, I did this somewhat intentionally. I, I chopped it up in a weird way. Um, obviously, when you're writing your own Devar Torah, you, you won't have that limitation. And so you can pick how you want to chunk it up. Um, so that's, that's one thing to bear in mind. One of the things I would say, though, is I think it's often tempting to make too big of a chunk. And the problem is when you have too big of a chunk to deal with, there's just so much you can't talk. It's hard to sometimes there is some value that comes from really zooming in on one on one smaller piece and saying what is here. Um, but I did want to throw that out there, that one of the things when you're looking at Devar Torah, when you're preparing one is saying you you have some choices here including how how what what you you want to even if you're saying I'm responding to this Torah portion which particular verses you pick, that's your choice. Zianya? Thank you. Um, I do have a question about uh, the, the assignment. Uh, do we have uh, like a due date? Are we presenting it next class or or, or how is it going to go? And also, because we had to reschedule this class, if all other classes are going to stay the same or are they going to be moved around? So those are two questions. So on the first one, on the assignment part of it, uh, we are going to, because many of you have been doing assignments along the way. Some of you have done some, some not others. 
So one of the things that Martin, I, and Paula and Betty Ann, we're going to work on in the next few weeks is having a, a list of all the assignments so you can know, make sure that you've done all the ones. Uh, we're working on that. I, I, I should have had, sorry, I'm one of these guys. Um, uh, sorry, uh, train of thought. Um, anyway, so we're working on that. So on the, as far as the assignment goes, the assignment is just to write write something. You don't have to 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 give it. We'd love it if you if you wanted to, either for an upcoming service or if you wanted to do it for the graduation service. That would be completely fine. That would be great. Um, but as far as for the assignment goes, what we're needing is all the assignments done by by by. We'll probably pick some date, maybe a couple of weeks before the graduation. Um, so there will be some some more time, but we'll try to get that pinned down pretty soon. As far as the class schedule for upcoming classes, let me jump. I'm going to use share screen just so we can look at this together to see what's coming up. And uh, where is my notes? Where is? We have one next week, Jane. We do. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Uh, I I just turn off share screens. I can't get to the address bar without it. But I do know we have several coming up. Uh, shoot, how do I get back over? Stop share. There we go. Um, let me pull up that document and we can see them. Okay, it's almost. But in any case, we try to keep the syllabus up to date. So if you look at the syllabus, it should tell you what's happening. And then, of course, it changes. We announce that. But yeah, so here's here's the syllabus document, and we'll scroll down to come on. I hit a button. There we go. So for our schedule coming up. So this was the July 14th. Next week, we have a guest speaker. Oh, that'll be awesome. Yehudas Fletcher on the Hasidic community, high control religion, faith to faithless, and the asylum work of humanist UK. Oh, that'll be fabulous. And then our schedule after that is August 4th. Martin is speaking on funerals, Yartzeit, Nahala. And Enyos. And then we have... Tentatively scheduled uh, August 18th is Kabbalah and September 1st. I, right now it just says last class, next steps for Jewish learning. And so, um, and then we'd be having the graduation in September. So we really don't have a lot of time. So I would say right now, I would probably say we need to get that assignment list out ASAP so that I would say we should probably try to have I'd probably say let's try to have the assignments done uh, by the end of August. So that would that would give us enough time just to make sure everyone has them in and, and everything. So that would be my suggestion. But uh, but we'll try to have that assignment list out pretty quickly just so that uh, – and again, we've been doing those along the way in the syllabus, but I think it might be helpful if we had it sort of as a chart so you could just check and make sure you have everything. So. <laughs> So anyway, that was our class for today. I'm going to turn off the recorder, but we can continue to, um, hanging out for a little bit longer if you'd like. And